Now, today's webinar is They Are Older Now, a snapshot of self-identified veterans in the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. Welcome to our distinguished speaker, Dr. Christina Wolfson. Dr. Wolfson is a professor in the Departments of Epidemiology, Biostatistics, and, Bio and Occupational Health and Medicine at McGill University. She is a senior scientist in the Brain Repair and Integrative Neuroscience, or BRAIN, program at the Research Institute of McGill University Health Center. Her research focuses on the study of neurological disorders in the population, such as most multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, epilepsy, amyliotrophic lateral sclerosis, and dementia, with an interest in identifying their burden, frequency, and risk factors. She is also our CLSA co-principal investigator and leads the Neurological Conditions Initiative and Veterans Health Initiative. Finally, she is the director of the CLSA Statistical Analysis Center. Um, again, once more, a reminder that there will be a question and answer session at the very end of the webinar, but feel free to write in the questions, any questions or concerns at any time during the webinar in the chat box, and we'll address them then. So now, we'll turn it over and welcome Dr. Christina Wilson. Thank you, Carol. Uh, thanks for the introduction. I'm very pleased uh, to be here today to, to make this presentation. Uh, and it's timely, um, November 13th, just two days away from November 11th. So I, I, I took this opportunity to uh, accept the invitation to present now. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is, I think, what is a unique uh, initiative uh, within the Canadian Longitudinal Study of Aging, and that is uh, self-identified uh, veterans within the cohort. So one of the first questions you might ask is, why would we be interested in studying veterans? And there are a number of, of uh, reasons for that. I mean, I think if you think about aging studies over the last couple of decades, many certainly in Canada and, and in the UK and in the United States, uh, many of those uh, individuals who were parts of longitudinal studies of aging uh, were subject to uh, wartime uh, exposures, perhaps either at home or overseas, and that could have shaped uh, their aging, uh, and that's why one of the reasons one, why one might be interested. And certainly, of course, these individuals served on behalf uh, of the population. And it's been estimated uh, that in Canada, there are 700,000 Canadian Armed Forces veterans. So that's a fairly significant uh, proportion uh, of the population, and these individuals are aging. Some, of course, uh, who, who were overseas have returned with injuries that may now, even years later, affect their health. And there is some literature to support uh, late life effects of earlier injuries. So military service could be an important determinant of health and, and possibly of healthy aging. One of the, the aspects of this research that struck me is that it is actually very difficult to identify veterans once they release from the military. And in fact, uh, my first foray into the area of research in veterans was spurred by work that I did on an, in a couple of Institute of Medicine panels in the United States where I was asked to participate in panels to look at the health effects uh, on the military of exposure to insecticides, uh, pesticides, and solvents, and then also in a subsequent committee to look at the possible risk of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis in returning Gulf War veterans. Sitting around the table uh, as the only Canadian uh, on the panel, more than once I was asked, well, what kinds of studies do you have in Canada uh, of veterans? And in those days, and that was early 2000, 2003, 2006, there was really very little uh, that I could tell them. And that sort of struck me uh, as a gap. Um, as Carol explained, my area of interest is in neurological diseases. So I, I put aside the issue of veterans uh, until uh, the CLSA uh, came to pass when I saw that there was a unique uh, opportunity. So just to put some of the numbers in context, um, in terms of service uh, from Canada, Canadian veterans, in World War I, there were approximately six, over 600,000 troops sent and one third of them were killed or wounded. At World War II, and this is the part of the cohort that some of whom are included in the CLSA, more than a million uh, troops were sent and over 100,000 were killed. Uh, Canada also participated in Korea, and you'll see the numbers there. Canada did not send troops directly to Vietnam, but there were over 30,000 Canadians who volunteered and served in Vietnam. 
the Gulf War, Afghanistan, and of course now uh, a lot of the, the troops, uh, the Canadian Armed Forces are involved in peacekeeping. So this is a significant portion uh, of the population in the past and currently who are put in situations which may in the short term, of course we know, but in the longer term as they age, uh, have some impact on their health. So what do we know about the health of veterans in Canada? Well, I said that, that we knew very little. And in 2013, uh, I was working with Dr. Catherine Tanzi, and uh, we put together a scoping review uh, of the, the level of information of health of veterans in Canada. And there was, in fact, very little information. Since that time, fortunately, there have been an, a, a couple of uh, large-scale studies generated through Veterans Affairs Canada and Statistics Canada looking at the transition uh, to, to civilian life. But these veterans uh, were those who were released between 1998 and 2007. So they are, in fact, younger veterans than, than uh, one might be interested in relation to World War II uh, and even the Korean War. There's also some extremely interesting work that is just coming out now uh, where Alison Mahar and Alice Aitken um, have identified veterans within the administrative databases uh, in Ontario. In fact, there is an identifier within the admin health administrative databases in Ontario. So they have been able to, to start a research program looking at these individuals who were released between about 1990 and 2014. I haven't actually been able to find any uh, research, large-scale research that looks at the, the health, psychological health or, or physical health or health service utilization of individuals released prior to 1990. So the, the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging Veterans Health Initiative uh, was something that evolved in the, the planning stages of the CLSA in around about 2005, 2006, 2007 where the, the CLSA PIs uh, connected with the Research Directorate of Veterans Affairs to discuss possible research opportunities within the CLSA. What was really, um, I think, quite a, a remarkable uh, initiative is this culminated in a partnership and Veterans Affairs Canada agreed to provide some financial support to include two supplement, supplementary modules in the baseline assessment of the CLSA to be asked of all uh, participants in the CLSA, and that was a set of veteran identifier questions and also a screening tool for post-traumatic stress disorder. And I'll talk about those uh, a little bit more later. So I know this is the CLSA webinar, but I don't know if everyone on, on this webinar is fully familiar uh, with the CLSA, so I do have a few slides to take you uh, through that. So the CLSA is a strategic initiative of the CIHR. Uh, planning began in 2001, and it took, I would say, close to 10 years uh, to, to actually get it funded and implemented. There are three co-PIs, Carmen Rain at McMaster, who's the lead uh, PI, Susan Kirkland at Dalhousie, and myself. Uh, that's not to mention that there are more than 160 co-investigators from across Canada involved. It's multidisciplinary. Uh, including biology, genetics, medicine, psychology, sociology, et cetera. It's basically trying to look at all aspects of aging. And it's the largest study of its kind in Canada, following, currently following uh, 51,000 participants who were aged 45 to 85 at enrollments. And the goal is to follow them from baseline for, t for at least 20 years. And I'll say at least because we would hope to get funding beyond that. Well, I think people after me would hope to get funding beyond that. So the CLSA has both an aim and a vision, and the aim is uh, as a longitudinal study of aging to examine transitions and to capture trajectories to enable the identification of modifiable factors with the potential to inform interventions and strategies to improve the health of populations as they age. That is the fundamental aim of the study, and that is how the study was designed in relation to the selection uh, of measures uh, that are included. The CLSA also has a vision, and its vision is to create a research platform and infrastructure. Uh, so that, what that means is that uh, researchers across Canada and actually outside of Canada, international researchers, have the opportunity to obtain the data uh, from the CLSA uh, and eventually to obtain the biospecimens from the CLSA and to use the infrastructure uh, for their own purposes. 
So just to ca encapsulating uh, the design overview, uh, I put some actual numbers in here now, 51,338 women and men in Canada who were aged 45 to 85 at baseline uh, were recruited. They're recruited in uh, two levels of data collection. On the left-hand side of the slide, you'll see 21,000 uh, individuals participate by through questionnaire interviews over the questionnaire interviews over the telephone only. We call that the tracking cohort. These individuals are randomly selected uh, from all 10 provinces and are truly representative uh, of the Canadian population insofar as that is possible with a, a volunteer cohort. On the right hand side, uh, we have over 30,000 people who have more in-depth assessment uh, than the telephone group, than the tracking cohort. So th these individuals undergo an in-person interview in their home, and it's essentially the same interview that is done by telephone. So at the end of the day, we have over 50,000 uh, individuals who have completed the same questionnaire. They then come into one of 11 data collection sites that, that have been built across uh, Canada for physical assessments and biospecimen collection. Now, due to the nature of, of the comprehensive cohort, the, the individuals who come for the, the full physical assessment, uh, the sites are essentially around academic areas. Uh, they are not randomly distributed across the country. There are, there are 11 sites in seven provinces, and individuals uh, for that component of the study were recruited within a geographic radius of 25 to 50 kilometers uh, for recruitment. So as I said, it's a 20-year study uh, the, with follow-up every three years, and we are actually currently uh, coming towards the end of our first follow-up. So we completed the baseline assessments in 2015, turned around very quickly to begin our first follow-up uh, on all 51,338 participants. We're also working very hard to establish data linkage with healthcare mortality and disease registries. So how do we recruit uh, these individuals? We use three different sampling frames. We started off with a partnership with Statistics Canada through the Canadian Community Health Survey on Healthy Aging. Um, we had Statistics Canada include a sharing question uh, within, the co within the questionnaire, and so individuals who agreed to share their contact information with the CLSA uh, were then forwarded to the CLSA for our own recruitment. This was the first uh, Statistics Canada had never released names to researchers in this way uh, before. That yielded us about 8,000 participants, so that wasn't enough for our 50,000 uh, planned cohort. We then entered into partnerships with provincial ministries of health uh, using the health card registration databases. What was done there is mail outs from the ministries of health were sent to the individuals with the, the framework within the types of people that we wanted, the age range, sex distribution, et cetera. Uh, those individuals then returned a consent to contact form and were followed up by the CLSA. Uh, that was not su a successful strategy uh, in all provinces. And so in the remaining provinces, we then did random digit dialing. We're very fortunate, um, however, to have very strong methodology working group, uh, experts in international experts in sampling, and they have created sampling weights uh, to enable us to use the full sample. So not to worry about the fact that we have three sampling frames. So one important point here is to discuss the exclusion criteria at baseline or at recruitment. We had to follow the, the exclusion criteria put in place by the Canadian Community Health Survey in order so uh, the rest of the sampling frames had to follow that. So the first, the first five are the exclusion criteria that come from CCHS. So we excluded residents of the three territories, those living in an institution, those living on a First Nation reserve, and I've highlighted, uh, we excluded full-time members of the armed forces, and we excluded temporary visa holders. The CLSA added two more criteria in relation to, to the way we were going to conduct the study. Individuals who were cognitively impaired at baseline uh, were excluded, 
Uh, certainly, if individuals become cognitively impaired within the study, as we as we follow them up, they are included because, of course, that's an important part, um, unfortunate important part of aging. And also, we were only able to conduct the study in English and in French. So, if an individual is unable to communicate in French or in English, they had to be excluded. So just this is a very busy slide just to show you some of the modules um, for the baseline questionnaire that were asked of all 51,000 participants. Just loosely categorize them into demographic, health, and social. The highlighted here in the demographic, we have the veteran status, and in the health, we have a PTSD screen. The additional assessments that were done, sorry about the formatting of this slide, the additional uh, assessments that were done for those individuals who came in were some basic anthropometric measures, some measures of function, and then the physical measures, including a blood sample and a urine sample. What I'm going to talk about today in relation uh, to the veterans really only deals with uh, the self-report information. We haven't yet completed the analyses using the physical measures. So how did we identify veterans in the CLSA? As I said, we used a set of veteran identifier questions that were provided to us uh, by Veterans Affairs Canada. And there was a recent publication uh, in 2006 by Linda Van Til et al. that described these questions and, and actually recommends or I think encourages uh, researchers to include such questions in large scale surveys. Uh, because as I said, we do have a bit of a challenge identifying veterans in Canada. In the 1951 census, there was a question on veterans. And then again, it was used in the 1961 census, the 1971 census, and the 1991 general social survey. Uh, and in 2003, a Canadian Community Health Survey used the questions, but we really do not have uh, a way of registering these individuals to, to know who they are, uh, how to find them, and how to link uh, their information with health registration databases, except uh, the work of, of Alison Mahar and Alice Aiken in Ontario. So as I said, we used uh, a PTSD screener. Uh, this was asked of all CLSA participants, not just veterans, and it was used over the phone and in the face-to-face in-home interviews. Uh, it, it is a screening tool, and these are the questions that are asked. It's very short. It doesn't take uh, very long uh, to, to implement. And, and we did de determine that it had been used over the phone uh, in other surveys. So it was validated uh, in the US Veterans Affairs primary care setting, and it's been shown to have uh, good sensitivity and specificity uh, compared to a clinician administered scale. It is a screening tool. It is definitely not a diagnosis. It does reflect DSM-4 diagnostic criteria using a score of at least three out of four uh, as the screening uh, threshold. So individuals who score three or four uh, on this tool would be determined to be PTSD screen positive. Uh, there's been some recent work uh, to, to modify the tool itself to reflect DSM-5 and so that there's a, a revision called the PC-PTSD-5. Uh, obviously, we're not using that in the CLSA because it's more recent uh, than our implementation. So I'm going to get right to giving you some uh, baseline data. And I'm going to focus on the self-reported veterans, although, of course, in some uh, results, I will be making comparison with uh, the full cohort. So here we go. So here are the numbers. So I've separated out the tracking cohort from the comprehensive cohort. So you'll see we have we identified using these questions a total of 3,558 Canadian veterans, 909 non-Canadian veterans, for 4,467 um, veterans in total. We did identify 68 individuals who reported current military service. Uh, they slipped through uh, the uh, eligibility criteria. And in fact, what was quite remarkable is this question was really well answered with only 12 out of 50,000 people uh, having missing data. So some very simple descriptors looking at the age. Um, I suspect none of you would be very surprised to see that the age of the veterans is older than the full CLSA cohort by a few years. 
um, the, and the non-Canadian veterans are, are the oldest group. Interestingly enough, the age range is the same. Not surprising, I'm sure, to anyone. They're predominantly male. Uh, about 50% of the full CLSA cohort is, is male-female. That was by sampling design. I've highlighted the number of females that we actually have amongst the veterans, which I think is important because this is a very, in, in, uh, in days past, there were very few female uh, veterans. So I think it's nice that we have a reasonably large size there. And then I've also reported the, the marital status of these individuals. This is a rather busy slide. I wanted to show you where these veterans came from. In the first column, you see we have the full sample. So that is the, the uh, individuals that were collected in the baseline, all 51,000. And the distribution of individuals is in relation to our sampling scheme. The Canadian veterans um, are very quite similar in, in the sense of uh, the distribution of where they live. Uh, slightly more Canadian veterans living in Nova Scotia than in the, in the full sample, but otherwise um, maybe slightly fewer living in, in Quebec than in the full sample, but otherwise quite similar. There is a big difference with the non-Canadian veterans, which is not surprising because the non-Canadian veterans are, are immigrants to Canada, and I, I suspect that this reflects at the time that they came, where the most popular provinces are, were uh, to uh, to immigrate, immigrate to. So British Columbia was one, and Ontario slightly higher. Um, New, Brun uh, New Brunswick was quite low. Uh, Nova Scotia was low. Newfoundland PEI pretty low. So I think that that just reflects uh, the immigration uh, patterns. I did want to take a look uh, about the non-Canadian veterans because as far as I have been able to tell, there's actually very little information in Canada on not veterans who served in, in other countries or veterans of other armed forces. So I just have this uh, chart here to show you the most commonly reported country of service. I don't think it, would, it surprises very many people that more, uh, about a third uh, of the non-Canadian veterans were veterans of the UK forces, um, 12, 13% from the US, 5% from the Netherlands, 7 to 10% from France, and then a small percentage from uh, Germany. There were actually looking at the raw data because we have this in open text, there were 253 countries uh, reported uh, in the data, but I'm only reporting those with uh, more than uh, two or three percent. The type of service, the question, the veteran affairs, uh, veteran identifier question asks for type of service. Uh, so we have uh, Army, Navy, Air Force, and Reserves. I didn't include the other category here because we had no understanding of what the other category category can be. But what you see is a, a difference in the uh, percentage of service in the Army, depending on whether they were Canadian veterans or non-Canadian veterans. The red refers to the non-Canadian veterans, and the blue to the Canadian veterans, and the green is to the total number of veterans. So most, uh, most people served in the Army or, or in the Reserves. So what was their age at CLSA enrollment? So we're talking about between 2012 and 2015. The red bar refers to the non-Canadian veterans and the blue bar uh, to the Canadian veterans. Again, uh, totally consistent. The non-Canadian veterans are older. 25% uh, of them are between 75 and 79 in enrollment, and 20% of them are over the age of 80. This reflects their, uh, the fact that they had to serve uh, in another country and then came to Canada afterwards. The duration of military service, uh, we had service as little as six months all the way up to 30 years of service within this cohort. The vast majority had service uh, less than five years. And again, uh, the non-Canadian veterans, nearly three quarters of them had, had service, reported service uh, of less than five years. Again, this is completely consistent with individuals serving and then coming uh, to another country. So what were the join years? Uh, I think this was important because we wanted to try and get a, establish where, you know, what conflicts these individuals may have served 
uh, in. Uh, we didn't, didn't, don't have that information in the question, so basically we just have to categorize it by year. Uh, the majority of individuals in, in both Canadian and non-Canadian veteran groups uh, served um, between 1950 and 1959, very few uh, recent uh, join years. So just want to give you, and this is, these are really preliminary results, one of the things that we were able to do with these data was to actually estimate uh, the number of veterans in Canada between the ages of 45 and 85. And the estimate that we came up with, and again, these are very preliminary results, which we have to verify, approximately 700 and, and say 20,000 Canadian veterans between the ages of 45, uh, 45 and 85 and 185,000 non-Canadian veterans between the ages of 45 and 85. So this is uh, over 900,000 uh, veterans in that particular age range uh, that we could estimate living in Canada. I believe that these are underestimates of the total number of veterans because of our exclusion criteria. Uh, we excluded people living in institutions. We excluded the territories. We excluded um, people who had current cognitive impairments. We also, of course, have the age range, so we're only talking about people age 45 to 85. This doesn't include veterans younger than the age of 45 or those uh, older than 85. And there are the average age of World War II veterans is about 93, I believe, so we would have excluded those. And also the, the timing uh, of the, the CLSA baseline, we're talking about 2012 to 2015. So now I want to give you a little bit, uh, some preliminary results on health status. So I've put on this slide both self-reported health, which is the first set of three columns, self-reported mental health, which is the middle set of three columns, and self-reported healthy aging. You'll see that there seems to be very little difference between the non-veterans in blue, the Canadian veterans in red, and the non-Canadian veterans in green. I think if you, you wanted to talk about trends, one could argue that seems the, the veterans seem to be uh, reporting slightly less very good to excellent healthy aging. But if you look at the numbers uh, and the percentages, they really are quite similar. So I pulled out a few uh, conditions uh, that we looked at uh, within this cohort, and I didn't bring out the conditions that had a lower than a 5% a uh, prevalence, and these are age and sex adjusted. Uh, so PTSD in non-veterans, we found a prevalence of 5.2%, 5, uh, 5 which increased in the Canadian veterans and then was highest in the non-Canadian veterans. I think with the men mental health disorders that we have, and this, of course, the anxiety mood disorder uh, and depression are really self-reports. The depression is based on the CESD. 10. What we do see is we do see slightly higher prevalence in the Canadian veterans and the highest uh, prevalence in the non-Canadian veterans. And these are age and sex uh, adjusted. In my original analyses, I thought that, uh, that age was responsible for this, but now that we've adjusted for age, we, we still see an effect. If we look at some of the, the physical chronic conditions, that the high blood pressure, heart disease, cancer, osteoarthritis of the knee, hip, and hand, we either see very little difference or, in fact, a slightly better uh, outlook uh, for, for the veterans. And again, there's lots, there are lots more analyses uh, to do on these data. So this is just your snapshot, as I said. I was, of course, very interested, since we included the PTSD screening tool, uh, to look at that within the veterans. And in fact, here we, we look at the score. Remember the score can be zero, one, two, three, or four. There are just five items. The vast majority uh, of individuals uh, in the full cohort, the non-veterans, Canadian veterans, and the non-Canadian veterans did not score anything on the PTSD uh, tool. So very high, 70, 75 to 76% scored zero. Uh, it's difficult to, to say that we see any real pattern here. Again, slightly higher, I think, in the non-Canadian veterans, but clearly more analyses to be done here. So one of the things that we wanted to do is to take a sort of a broad look at 
uh, factors associated with uh, PTSD screen positive versus screen negative. And again, this, these are cross-sectional data, so it's very difficult to, to make any uh, interpretations of uh, what comes first. Uh, I've highlighted um, blue and then black just to separate out the various different variables. I just wanted to show you, this is the full sample, so this includes uh, the non-veterans. What was interesting, we found that there seemed to be an increased odds ratio in relation to retirement. So PTSD screen positive more likely in those with complete retirement uh, or partial retirement relative to not being retired. Uh, there appeared to be a, an association between being female and uh, PTSD screen positive. Both uh, the Canadian veterans and the non, well, the Canadian veterans for sure had a statistically significant odds ratio in relation to PTSD uh, relative to the non-veterans. The Canadian veterans didn't reach statistical significance. The non-Canadian veterans didn't reach statistical significance, but that could probably be a numbers thing. Being married um, relative to being single uh, appeared to be, I don't want to say protective because there's no um, directionality here, but was associated uh, with uh, less likely screening positive. Education, we see uh, the association such that higher levels of education seem to be associated uh, with uh, less likely screening positive for PTSD. And there appeared to be a slight protective uh, effect in being in the comprehensive uh, group rather than the tracking group. So that's just looking at the full sample. So here everyone uh, is included, the non-veterans, the Canadian veterans, and the non-Canadian veterans. Then I wanted to, to look just at uh, the veterans as a group uh, themselves, uh, looking, to, pooling together the Canadian veterans and the non-Canadian veterans, and this is the, the best fitting model. What we found was a slight uh, association uh, with age, whereas individuals, older individuals were less likely to screen positive for PTSD. Uh, but again, uh, we saw the retirement effect uh, with a slightly higher odds ratio this time. So individuals who were completely ret retired were more likely to also screen positive on PTSD. Those who are partly retired, uh, slightly more slightly more positive, uh, more likely to screen positive PTSD relative to people who are not retired. So the, the retirement variable uh, is coming back. Now just looking at the group of Canadian veterans, because we know that the non-Canadian veterans bring some other factors uh, with them in, in relation to uh, you know, their heterogeneity. So, so what we saw, uh, just looking at the smaller group now of Canadian veterans, 30, about 3,500 individuals, we saw the inverse association with age, uh, the retirement variable uh, was retained, and here there was an Army indicator, so individuals uh, who reported service in the Army relative to any other uh, grouping in Navy, uh, Air Force, or Reserves, we're more likely to screen positive on the PTSD screening tool. This is a screening tool. We have no diagnosis of PTSD. So one of the things we did uh, is to just look and see how scores on this tool and also screen positive versus screen negative on this tool were associated uh, with other mental health measures. And again, cross-sectional data. We saw that we got the anticipated um, or at least hypothesized relationships between the screen positive and self-reported mood, anxiety disorder, and depression. So those individuals who screen positive were all also more likely to report having been told they had a mood disorder, anxiety disorder, or depression. Uh, we found the inverse uh, association with satisfaction with life. So these individuals were less likely uh, to report high levels of satisfaction with life, high self-rated health, high self-rated mental health, or high self-rated healthy aging. So these are sort of the anticipated uh, relationships that we saw, which were somewhat uh, comforting, which shows that this measure seems to be uh, at least acting in the same way as other mental health measures. So sort of what are our preliminary findings? And these are very preliminary. There's a lot more work to do. 
So self-reported veterans appear to be very similar uh, to non-veterans in relation to self-reported physical conditions, at least with those with a prevalence of at least 5%. We didn't see any major uh, differences uh, amongst the, the veterans and the non-veterans. What we did see, I think, suggests a slightly higher self-reported measures of some mental health uh, concerns in relation to PTSD, mood disorder, anxiety disorder, and depression. And, and just to emphasize again that these were age and sex adjusted when we presented them. And these seem to be most apparent uh, amongst non-Canadian veterans. What was interesting was the robust finding um, of retirement uh, as a correlate of positive PTSD screen. And interestingly enough, this is consistent uh, with some other studies that have shown uh, what has been suggested as a sort of a resurgence uh, of PTSD symptoms following retirement or at around, around the time of stress thinking about retirement. But as I mentioned before, these are cross-sectional data so we don't know whether um, the, the, the factors that are associated with screening positive on a PTSD screening tool may actually contribute to someone retiring. So we really don't know what direction is going on here. But these data are, as I said, consistent uh, with some other studies. There, are also, there is a, a recent study that was reported on Vietnam uh, veterans that, in fact, um, 40 years following their service, uh, there was new evidence of PTSD that had, was directly linked uh, to that war service. How we investigate this in the CLSA, I think we'll have to do uh, further analyses to, to see whether this is a real finding or whether retirement is just a proxy uh, for something else. So what are the limitations? Uh, there are a number of limitations. What we have, and I think the first thing, is that we have self-reported uh, veteran status. We don't have any way to verify that these individuals are truly uh, veterans. I think um, in the paper that I mentioned that Linda Van Til wrote in 2016, I think she suggests that there's probably no reason for people uh, to self-report they are veterans when they're not. I think perhaps people may underreport veteran status depending on the experience they had uh, in the military. Uh, so I suspect that we there are probably more there. I certainly have had anecdotal reports of individuals who served, um, who did uh, compulsory military service in countries like Israel and South Africa actually would not regard themselves as veterans. Uh, so I think we probably do have some underreporting there. Obviously, right now, we're just using the self-reported uh, health measures. As I said before, the PTSD screen is not a diagnosis uh, of PTSD. It is just a screening tool. It's been used widely and has been validated, but again, it's a screening tool. The data are cross-sectional, uh, so we cannot really uh, talk about cause. We can't really talk about predictors or protective factors. So what are we going to do? Well, I think we, we have to do much more detailed analyses to confirm the performance of uh, the PTSD screening tool. We can look at much more detail in, in some other analyses in relation to some of our tools of psychological distress that we included in the CLSA. Uh, as I mentioned early on in the talk, uh, we did not include the objective measures of health, and we did not include the cognitive measures. So I think that that's a, probably one of the priorities. We should look at the comprehensive participants, so the individuals who came for the full assessment, and look to see whether we can um, confirm some of these findings in relation to the physical uh, characteristics by looking at the, objective, the more objective measures. So I'm going to uh, just want to do some acknowledgments here. Obviously, the first acknowledgment is to the CLSA participants. And I should say that the data analyses that have been done here were supported by the contract from Veterans Affairs Canada and also from a CIHR uh, Catalyst grant. And, uh, and here I just include the general acknowledgment uh, for the CLSA. So overall, one of the things I want to say is I think that the data that we have on the self-reported veterans, even with the caveats I gave, are a unique uh, resource within Canada to have a group of individuals who did not know they were going to be asked questions about whether or not they were veterans 
they answered, and, and in fact, the answers of the veterans have the lowest level of missing data uh, of any uh, of the, the, the rest of the participants in the CLSA. So I think we have the opportunity with uh, this sample to do some interesting work once we dig a little bit deeper. Uh, haven't, I also haven't um, investigated any differences between males and females uh, in the, the physical health and the mental health, and I think that that's, uh, that's important to do. So with that, I think I'm going to stop here and uh, certainly got plenty of time uh, for questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Wolfen. That was an excellent presentation, very interesting. I'd like to thank you for your continued leadership in the CLSA as well. Um, we'll open it up now uh, to questions. As a reminder, uh, muting will remain on. Uh, but you can enter your questions into the chat box in the bottom right-hand corner of the WebEx window. Um, I don't think there's been any questions so far, so we'll go ahead and uh, give people a little time to uh, ask questions to the chat box, and I'll go ahead and field one for myself. Um, so did you look at any comparisons with other countries, particularly the U.S. or European veterans? Um, particularly with the U.S. because of the different health care programs and the different Veterans Affairs medical uh, care programs, it might be an interesting comparison. Yeah, well, that, that's one of the things that's going to come next. We, we, it actually took us quite a lot of time to identify exactly, to, to sort of clean up exactly who were the veterans and, and distinguish the Canadian veterans from the non-Canadian veterans. Uh, there are... There are a number of studies, you can imagine, there are actually a lot of studies in the U.S., but they tend to be focused around, quite reasonably, specific types of veterans. So there are uh, studies on Vietnam veterans, studies on Gulf War veterans, studies on Korean veterans. And so it's a little bit difficult for, to do the comparisons. As I said, that we, we don't really know the, whether the individuals were veterans of, of the Korean War or whether they were Canadians serving in the U.S. military in, in Vietnam. So some of the analyses are a little bit uh, difficult to do. The, the comparisons that we made are, 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 found, are sort of um, based on some of the results that we've seen, you know, we've seen in other studies looking, for instance, at um, you know, obviously the mental health outcomes and there are some things we can't look at, infections, for instance, cirrhosis, we couldn't look at, uh, but we have tried to look at some things. I, I want to dig deeper, look at the musculoskeletal. We didn't have uh, enough numbers to really look at some of the neurological conditions. We couldn't really look at Parkinson's disease. Uh, and obviously, dementia would have been excluded at baseline in the CLSA. Uh, so, you know, they're, they're informed. We informed our analyses with previous data, but I think we have a sort of a unique situation here in Canada. Certainly. I see a question here. <clears throat> yeah, I'll go ahead and read it. This is okay. <laughs> yeah, so this is a question from Alan. Yeah, so is there, was there a difference in cancer between veterans? Oh, it looks like there was. No, we haven't had a chance to, to look at the subtypes yet. Uh, we do have a little bit of information in open text on the cancer subtypes, so we could look at that. So thanks. That's uh, something we will look at. There, can you imagine there's a wealth uh, uh, of things we could, different directions we, we could go in. So thanks, yeah, that's something we would look at. Or someone else could look at it because these data are available to the research community. Did you show any difference between the cancer between veterans and non-veterans? Was there a slide? That, there was a slight, uh, a slight you know, percentage difference, but we, we only really adjusted by age and sex, so we haven't looked at any other characteristics. Mm -hmm. So um, talking about kind of that future directions and, and work, are you going to be looking at kind of a cohort effects maybe from the different conflicts and questions? Uh, yeah, well, that's things like follow up to cancer, you know, thinking of more modern agent yeah. work type of issues versus, you know, cognitive decline for older veterans, that type of thing. Well, one of the things, that, and that, that sort of raises a very important point, one of the things we haven't yet done, we've, we've looked at them as a group, you know, looking at the Canadian veterans and the non-Canadian veterans, one of my plans is to arrange them on timelines according to their their join year and release year, and you know, to try and establish what it's like, where it's likely they might have served, or what conflict they would have been in the military during. That we haven't done. We've looked at 
duration of service and join year and release year, but we haven't mapped that on to the Canadian uh, the Canadian military history of um, of when the troops were sent to various places. So we will look at that, but we don't have any uh, Gulf War uh, veterans in this group. Right. Yeah. Well, we'll wait for a couple of other questions to come in. Um, I was struck by how much PTSD there seemed to be for non-veterans. Was yeah. there an actual there was a significant difference between being a veteran, yeah. a Canadian veteran, yeah. and having a higher relationship yeah. with PTSD? But there's a lot of PTSD out there for the general population as well. It seems like for for yeah. older adults. Yeah. Well, there's a growing uh, a, gr a growing area of research. I, I hear myself. Uh, uh, Echoing here. Yeah, so there is a, there's a growing area of a research on something called late onset stress symptomatology uh, in older adults that can manifest itself in PTSD like symptoms. And some studies have actually shown in older adults can be as high as 12%. Mm -hmm. PTSD, of course, is, is you know, a reaction to a, a stress, and that stress can be death of a spouse, it can be a traumatic event, any kind of a traumatic event. We don't know what the traumatic event is in, in the individuals in the CLSA, but even retirement. So it, 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 it makes sense when you think about it that older people having lived longer and having more uh, happen in their lives could be at higher risk for PTSD-like symptoms. So yeah, so that's another thing I want to look at, and I'm that's why I'm really pleased that we asked the PTSD screener of all CLSA participants, not just those who screened, who said that they were veterans. This allows us to make an internal comparison. And you're right. I mean, it is a, a fairly high percentage of individuals who screen positive who are not veterans. Uh, how that relates to uh, their aging is another question. And I've already seen in some analyses that other researchers are doing on the CLSA data that they have actually included this variable as a, as a measure of mental health, which is why I think it's important to that, that I, one of the things I really want to do is to take the PTSD screen and investigate it in relation to the other measures. Uh, you know, maybe it's a, it's a proxy for other measures. Maybe the other measures are proxies for it. So I need to look at it again, but you're right. There, there is a higher than expected uh, prevalence of PTSD screen positive in the non-veterans as well. So do we have any other questions from the field? We can spend a couple more minutes on uh, question and answers. Well, I'll, I'll do one final one for myself. Um, was, there's no open text information on retirement. There's no you can't look at the reasons for your retirement or the age of retirement as kind of that. Oh, we, we can, we can, we can, we can. Oh, I see there's a question. Yeah. Okay. From Jim Thompson. Your PTSD prevalence numbers are very interesting. Prior Canadian general population estimates have been much lower, less than 2%, but I've always suspected they should be higher. Your prevalence is based on the PCPTSD symptom measures are interesting. So I think that feeds back into the conversation we were just having, but it is a very interesting finding. Yeah. I mean, it seems like a small percentage, but when you round that out to you know how many individuals we're talking about in this age range, uh, I think that's quite uh, quite interesting. So okay. thank you. Any, and any, go ahead. I just want to say one last thing. If anybody has any specific questions for me about this presentation or this whole area of research or interested in using the CLSA data in relation to the veterans, I'm very happy to communicate uh, with anyone. Um, it's, uh, I think it's a, a unique, small database, but I think it's unique. And as, as I've said in the very beginning, this is a research platform. So I would be really interested if we could you know, get a kind of a consortium of people interested in, in veterans' health to work around these data. It'd be great. Well, we did have another uh, question roll in. So the health indicator prevalences are very similar to the findings from CCHS 2003, which included mm -hmm. a veterans identifier and very different from the LASS survey yeah. in 2010. Yeah. 2013 and 2016, which looked at former CAF members aged 20 to 65, roughly. Do you want to speak to that? Well, our, our folks are older. That's the only uh, thing right. I can say about that. 
So, yeah, and I think that's the, the transition to civilian life, the LASS surveys have uh, individuals releasing, uh, I think, what I, I mean, obviously the questioner knows better than I do, but I think 1990 to 2014 or 1998 to 2013. Uh, so these are mostly uh, younger veterans. Well, they're not veterans that released a long, long time ago. Most of our people released far well before that. Yeah, and um, looking at the different associations between all the things they're looking at with different surveys will be in interesting in the future yeah. as well when you do the further analysis. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I think this is really an emerging area of research uh, in in Canada, and I think it, I, I think it's a very important uh, area of research. And we already have some leaders with Alice Aiken and Linda Van Til and Alison Mahar doing some very interesting uh, stuff. Well, thank you again. Uh, it was really a very, very nice uh, presentation, so we appreciate it, particularly for this month of remembrance. Thank you. So um, I'd like to remind everyone that the CLSA data access request applications are ongoing. If you're interested in gaining access to the CLSA data, uh, the next deadline for applications is on January 29, 2018. You can visit the CLSA website under Data Access to review available data, further information, and details about the application process. I'd also like to mention that our next webinar uh, is scheduled for December 12th. We'll be talking about visual impairment and eye care utilization in Canadian emotional setting and aging with Dr. Ellen Friedman. Uh, please uh, register and join our next webinar.